Those tweets I sent about Duke Ellington while my mom was being evicted again. According to what ethics under the sun can I possibly have been speaking? A kind of private feeling I can't even place here. Like a rock on a tomb or the thank you gift of a guest whose plane leaves long before dawn. I feel the little school of minnows in me changing direction, wavering pieces of consciousness eloquently describing to me giving up on the thought of ever reaching you, then setting to feeding on something closer by an approximation of what we could have had, one that asks less of me, one that asks nothing of you. I put the device back in my pocket and keep walking. Hello, and welcome to Words That Burn, a podcast about poetry. Each week, I read a poem, look at its inner workings, and hopefully show you what makes it tick. This week's poem is Inner Life by Ariana Raines. Before I begin, I have a suggestion. Try to find a copy of the poem somewhere so that you can read along. It's hard to put into words the effect that Ariana Raines' poetry can have on you. This poem is one of a multitude in her tome-like collection, A Sandbook. The title of the 400-page collection is, to my mind at least, a reference to the way in which she uses language to write her work. Each poem feels like a handful of sand in a given moment. What I mean by that is the pacing and viewpoint seem to be moving at an alarming speed. Her writing seems a far cry from the laboured works of the likes of T.S. Eliot or W.B. Yeats. Her work is almost as though we, the reader, are experiencing her feelings in the same moment that she is. And yet it's clear from her extensive references and excellent grip on structure, rhythm and wordplay that this is a poet who understands what came before her and more than that, embraces it. Reigns refers to herself as a lyric poet. Her intense dedication to autobiographical work is proof enough of this. Almost all of her poems are born from some personal experience, some deep wound, some moment of personal revelation, some absolute high of experience. She takes her role as a lyric poet very seriously, attempting to bridge the gap between her own emotions and the audience's understanding by moving past simple autobiography, approaching instead something akin to a stream of consciousness. She once said in an interview, I consider poetry the bleeding edge of consciousness. This commitment to the real, conveying her own emotion, can lead the reader to a kind of whiplash, as Rain's life has been anything but easy. There are hints to this in the opening lines of this very poem. Her homeless mother, who was also schizophrenic, was the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Rain's has spoken unflinchingly about her time as a sex worker, as well as the trauma that such work inflicted upon her. One section of a sand book is called The Worst Year of My Life. This uncompromised window into Rain's soul through her poetry is intense and can be almost jarring for a reader, perhaps for the strong connection such vulnerability creates between her and her reader. There is a resonance to be found in each of her poems, something that everyone can connect to. Naturally, her experience has also given her an intense class consciousness. She is sometimes asked to defend her choice of first-person view, which dominates the majority of her work. In response to this, she launched a passionate defense of the use of the subject I in her poetry. In her own words, If there is an I there, um, which is to say, it seemed like an almost aristocratic put-on that these sort of educated liberal white people could get over their eyes Whereas, you know, you'd have like slam poets who are just I, I, I all the time. And these kind of more, um, like in the academy anyway, like sort of degraded forms of poetry. Um, Always, there's always an I when it has to do with someone who is oppressed. Um, When somebody is forced to speak or moved beyond their own control. If you feel having listened to her speak, that Reigns has a tendency to be a little esoteric, bordering on the arcane, you would not be alone. She has mentioned in other interviews that she views poetry as something fluid, 
without any limits. This sense of abandonment, as well as a fusion of the spiritual, academic, arcane and often some form of lunacy, leads to a dense, chaotic and complex form of poetry that I hope you'll enjoy sifting through just as much as I do. The autobiographical tone is clear from those opening lines of inner life, those tweets I sent about you, Gellington, while my mom was being evicted again. According to what ethics under the sun can I possibly have been speaking? A kind of private feeling I can't even place here. Like a rock on a tomb, or the thank you gift of a guest whose plane leaves long before dawn. There's an instant connection between Reigns and her generation established in the word tweets. The reader can understand that we are firmly in the modern. Biography and her own life instantly follow and she talks about her mother's eviction. A sense of tiredness and tragedy can be found in the word again. The reader is aware that this is not a monumental or notable moment for Reigns, but merely another link in a long chain of difficult events. The unfortunate thing about these opening lines is, as I previously mentioned, their density. There's a risk they will alienate the reader with their obscurity. Reigns was once asked to expand on the cryptic mention of Duke Ellington in one interview. She said, The man is such a miracle, and there is so much restorative and feeling power in this music. The restorative power, she goes on to say, was essential to her surviving moments of great upheaval in her life. It's not the first poem in which she mentions Ellington. And so, in mentioning him again in another poem, she creates a kind of coded reference, an inside joke or signal between herself and her readership. What it means is that this is a poem of change and difficulty. Following that, a note of anxiety or insecurity enters the verse. She puts a question to herself. According to what ethics under the sun can I possibly have been speaking? Reigns is now evaluating some past action, trying to understand her own viewpoint from the present. She becomes aware that she seems to have lost it. Her perspective is gone. She says it was a private feeling, one she can't place now. She invokes a sense of cold emptiness in the words, a rock across a tomb. She then leaps forward to the modern to say that it's like a gift left by a guest whose plane left early. This striking image brings to mind the bitterness of goodbyes we never had a chance to say, or the cold, inhuman gestures we sometimes perform to avoid real emotional connection. It's akin to the stiff handshake at a funeral, or staring into your phone intently while something kicks off on public transport. This is a compelling mixture of old romantic imagery, almost biblical, the rock across the tomb, and a completely new set of familiar imagery, one very much of the 21st century. This fusion of ancient meets modern, nature meets tech, is nothing new for Reigns. It has been noted by several academics that this fusion and new way of thinking is at the heart of most of her work. She is very focused on the way in which modern communication via Twitter and online discourse is altering the way we perceive and engage in real-life emotion. More than that, she sees it as a reason to return to older ritualistic ways of moving through life. Not religious doctrine, but definitely a form of spiritualism. Anxiety surges forward in the next few lines as Rain displays her skill in imagery and metaphor. I feel the little school of minnows in me changing direction. Wavering pieces of consciousness eloquently describing to me, giving up on the thought of ever reaching you. It would be easy to engage in cliché here and talk about butterflies in the stomach, as the common idiom goes. Reigns, however, is searching for a more kinetic, that is to say physical, metaphor. Minnows seem the perfect choice. Those huge, countless swarms of fish moving as one in the sea. For me, I can feel the pull in the stomach, that unwelcome rush of movement when we think of someone or experience an emotion of embarrassment. The words changing direction let us know the unease at work here and we understand 
when she transforms her fish into wavering pieces of consciousness, that her mind is completely restless too. She seems torn, though they have a clear thought to deliver her. Stop hoping this person will get in touch. The you of this section is unknown to us. It could be a lover, as many of the subjects in Rain's poetry are, or someone the poet could previously rely on in times of difficulty. However, it would seem that time has passed. Moving past that, the minnows of her mind realize that reaching this person is not going to happen, and so find something else to occupy their time. Then, setting to feeding on something closer by an approximation of what we could have had, one that asks less of me, one that asks nothing of you. Here Rain solidifies the idea of the you in the previous verse as a lover of some sort. Rather than face into the reality of the lack of this person, she instead engages in an escape to the idyllic. A moment of imagining where she and this other person worked out. The inclusion of the word feeding here, in her metaphor of the minnows, is interesting. It seems to indicate that this anxiety, or overthinking, takes up or consumes all her time. It's a hint to the destructive nature of what she's going through. It was clearly a difficult relationship, with strong egos on both sides. She talks of what they could have had, a situation where neither asked the other to change. There is again an increased sense of pain, as Rain states less would be asked of her, whilst nothing would be asked of her partner. The listener gets a sense that this infatuation was very much one-sided. The fluidity of Rain's poetry is on full display here. Her images and themes hopping from place to place, in sequence with a logic known only to her. In the space of a few short lines of poetry, we've covered Duke Ellington, family crisis, waves of anxiety, loss and heartbreak. It's a lot in a little. The speed and flow with which she moves through these topics is fully intentional. In her own words, people have different kinds of understandings of form and structure and accuracy. This is especially true of an art like poetry, which is so liquid. It can be about anything. It can take any form. And you don't have to pay anybody for equipment. There's absolutely no restriction on it. Rain seems to enjoy both experimenting with and creating new forms to truly make use of this lack of restriction she describes. The final line of the poem seems a true recognition of the lack of communication between the pair. I put the device back in my pocket and keep walking. She is done trying. More than that, this final line brings the poem full circle in an odd kind of way. We started with a reference to technology in tweets and we end with the device returning to her pocket. Technology and internet communication is the full circle here. Very little has been resolved. There is not much finality to be had as the poet continues on her way. For me, this is extremely revealing as to the nature of Rain's popularity with a modern audience. Her work connects in many senses with normal life. There is no grand gesture here, no wallowing, no towering metaphor. She, like many others, simply doesn't have the time. It is this true grappling with the mundane of everyday life that marks her out as a modern poet. So why this poem? I'm a huge fan of romantic and lyrical poetry. Unfortunately, I feel that its popularity has waned in the 21st century. We simply don't have the same access to breathtaking nature that the lakeside poets had. More importantly, the language used in lyric and lakeside poetry is often a little too grand for the modern age. Constant references to Greek epics and ancient texts can be as alienating to a reader today as obscure tweets about Duke Ellington. So where can such tightness forms of yesteryear go? The answer is Ariana Raines. She was once described as something of a bridge between the ancient and the novel. 
and it seems to fit perfectly. She has taken all the literary advances of modernism and postmodernism, from stream of consciousness to Dada experiments in form and language, and fused them with this older romantic style. She is unabashed in her exploration of how she engages with and moves through the world. In doing so, she has found a way to constantly resonate with her readers. To my mind, there's no finer thing a poem or poet can achieve. What's your reading of the poem? I'd like to point out, as always, that this is my interpretation, and so very much up for debate. If you'd like to talk to me about it, or if you'd like to suggest a poem you'd like to hear covered on the podcast, you can reach me in a few ways. Send me an email at wordsthatburnpodcast at gmail.com. You can find my website, www.wordsthatburnpodcast.com, where you'll find the show notes for this episode, complete with references. If none of that suits you, I'm on Instagram. Just search Words That Burn Podcast. There you can find helpful study guides and bonus content. This episode was written and produced by me, Benjamin Colopy. The music in this week's episode is by Scott Buckley and is used under Creative Commons license. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider giving me a review on whatever platform you listen on. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to me once again. I'm looking forward to a very poetic 2021 with you, and hopefully you'll hear from me again soon.